Uh, yeah, thank you, organizers, for giving me a chance to talk here or there. Okay, but via Skype. So, so actually, it's the first time I try giving a talk via Skype. So I don't know actually it works or not, but uh, hopefully I think uh, it's work well. So today I will try to talk about the uh, convex real collective uh, projective dense feeling. Okay. So this drawing work with uh, Su Young Choi and uh, Ludovic Marquis. So let's start. So, okay, let's see. Now. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, so motivation start from the, this uh, certain then filling theorem, uh, which is that if the interior of a compact three manifolds M, where the toral boundary, so is that we have a torus boundary, admits a complete hyperbolic structure of finite volume. Then almost all the feelings of M admit the hyperbolic structure. So probably it's better to uh, give us some examples. So, so this here is a figure and not complements in S3. So we have uh, this three-dimensional sphere, and I just draw the, this figure A knot, and then you take we take the tubular neighborhood of this figure A knot, and then we take out from the three-dimensional sphere, and then of course uh, this object become compact three manifolds with a uh, one torus boundary, okay, and so well known fact that. The figure A not complements admit the complete hyperbolic structure of the finite volume. Okay, and then one of the obvious uh, compact three manifolds with a torus boundary will be uh, solely torus. Okay, so both three manifolds have a same boundary, which is a torus. So actually, we can glue these two objects via boundary, right? So, of course, there are several ways you can glue these two manifolds, but the person then filling theorem tell us that actually, except the finite number of them, all the then filling actually admit hyperbolic structure. Okay? But of course, actually, this kind of the phenomenon actually happens only for three manifolds, even though there exists a topological then fillings for any compact n manifolds with the toral boundary here that is at this T. So let's see. Pen. So this one is a S1 cross dot dot, dot S1. So n minus one times. So it's toral boundary. And obviously there are another compact manifold with the same toral boundary, which is a, a disk times t to the m minus two. So again, topologically, we can uh, we can have uh, this stenciling. So we can glue the original manifolds m and this uh, let's say solely torus along the boundary. But the, the problem is that now, even if the interior of this n manifolds admit hyp, uh, this hyperbolic structure of finite volume, actually no then filling of this m admits a hyperbolic structure. So one of the main reasons is that here this, uh, this torus, so if you the, this boundary is uh, Exactly that is t n minus one, this torus, but the n is bigger than three, then it has a, it, this torus has a abelian subgroup of the rank uh, bigger than one. So it's, of course, this, uh, this abelian group cannot be inside this hyperbolic structure. Okay. But the motivation is that actually, 
Okay, so high public structure is impossible. Then actually, can they admit the larger geometric structure? So I explained what it means for us a larger. But another motivation is that actually the Anderson and Barmer proved that the many features of the infilling theory for hyperbolic three manifolds can be generalized to Einstein metric in any dimension. It's meaning that so let's start with uh, this compact D manifold, as M manifolds, an interior admit a finite volume hyperbolic structure. Of course, the damp filling does not admit the hyperbolic structure, but actually, except a finite number of them, almost all they are actually admit Einstein metric. So somehow they enlarge the, this hyperbolic structure to the Einstein metric. And it's actually get the this surgery theorem. So in this way, uh, in general, it's hard to construct the Einstein metric on a, this closed manifold. But using a surgery, actually, we can have a, this several this uh, example. Okay. So what I mean is the uh, geometric structure here. So of course I'm, my geometry is uh, this XG. So X is a uh, homogeneous space and G is a Lie group acting transitively this homogeneous space. And we are, we of course, know everything about this uh, spherical geometry and Euclidean geometry and hyperbolic geometry. Somehow this is a classical geometry. But previously the hyperbolic geometry is somehow inside the sub-geometry of real product geometry. So usually the real product geometry, we consider real product space and automorphism group of the real product space. But here it's uh, more easier to deal with the double cover of them. So product sphere is uh, the older space of the, this ray. So it's a half uh, ray, a uh, half line. And automorphism of the projective sphere is a matrix group, which is uh, all the matrix whose determinants plus minus one. So both objects is actually double cover of the, this, uh, for example, the real project space, and then this is a uh, PGL M plus one R. So I think I just briefly trying to explain why all these geometry is sub geometry. So for example, the Spherical geometry is sub-geometry. The reason is that we can put the inner product is uh, that proper that product is a space a vector space m plus one dimensional, and the sphere is uh, all the all the points have the same distance from the origin, which is one. And again, in this case, all this ray is uh, intersect with uh, this sphere is exactly one. So of course it's a uh, homeomorphic to the productive sphere. And isometry group of the uh, sphere is orthogonal group, which is uh, all the matrix which preserve the inner product. Okay. And the Euclidean space, also we can consider it a subspace in the projective sphere in such a way that the Euclidean space is lie on uh, this corner, which is the last corner is the one. And then again, every this array is intersect, uh, should be intersect with the uh, end most one point. So in other way, in a Euclidean space also uh, sub subset of the, this projective sphere and isometric group of the uh, Euclidean space is exactly the matrix we can write down in this form. So A, B, and 0, 1 is this block form, and A is also going to group, and B is a vector. So it's a Euclidean isometry. And the lastly, hyperbolic uh, geometry, also the sub-geometry, is instead of taking the inner product as before uh, for the sphere, we take the Lorentzian product, and our space are n, comma 1. And then hyperbolic space is a space whose distance has become minus one. And then there are 
Of course, we have a two seat of hyperboloid, and then we take the only one, which is the uh, last cone is positive. And then again, the, this, the, uh, every ray is intersect with uh, this hyperbolic space and most one point. So hyperbolic space is a uh, subspace in a projective space, a projective sphere. And this group of isometric iso group of the hyperbolic space is a uh, sub subgroup in this SL plus minus, in particular, this uh, older matrix, which preserve the hyperbolic space. Okay. So in this way, we can uh, put the all the classical geometry into the projective geometry. So obvious, my consideration is that we're trying to generalize the hyperbolic structure to the projective structure. And one another Okay, so of course, uh, in, in small dimensional case, all these, uh, for example, the, this, uh, all the surfaces admit the projective structure. Okay. And one remark is that this old structure actually has uh, this property is a convexity. So what it means is a convex. So a subset omega is convex if it's intersection with uh, any gray circle is connected. So it's a, of course, this gray circle is corresponding to the two dimensional vector space and it intersect with the intersection is connected. And it is properly convex if in addition, it's closure does not contain any antipodal point. So for example, let's try to give us some examples. So this is a Sphere is convex because all the intersection is actually the great uh, intersection with the gray circle is a gray circle, so it's a connected, so it's a convex. And this Euclidean space also convex, but of course this omega, I mean the Euclidean space does not contain two opposite points, but its closure, its closure is actually basically the same as a, a closed hemisphere, so it contains uh, to opposite point. So this Euclidean space also is not properly convex, but hyperbolic space is properly convex. So I'm trying to generalize the uh, hyperbolic structure. So the right uh, generalization should be the properly convex real projective uh, geometry. So these are the main question. So let M be a compact N manifold with a union of tori as a boundary such that the interior of M admit finite volume hyperbolic structure. Actually, almost to almost all the infilling of M admits a properly convex projective structure. So these are the question. And once again, the definition of the, this uh, the Manifold M admits properly convex projective structure if M is homeomorphic to the omega quotient by gamma, where omega is properly convex subset of projective sphere, and gamma is a discrete subgroup of SL plus minus, acting properly discontinuously on the, this omega. So in general, it's very hard to construct those examples. So now we're trying to do more simpler example in a sense that I'm trying to uh, deal with a particular OV4 is uh, actually reflection OV4, also called the Coxeter OV4. So I'm trying to first introduce this uh, object Coxeter group. So Right to construct the Coxeter group, so we need this Coxeter system, which is a pair of a finite set S, so it's a S and M. So S and M is a symmetry matrix uh, such that all the diagonal entry is one, and the other entry, so off diagonal entry should be uh, two, three, and and including also the infinity. So these are the Coxeter system. So whenever we have a Coxeter system, we can have a Coxeter 
group. So how can we can generate this Cox's group? So the co group W, who has a group presentation. So here, the generator should be the set S, and the relation will be uh, ST and M to the uh, to the MST power, and then this is uh, will be the uh, relation. So for example, S and T is a uh, same, then S S to the one. So S square should be the one. So is a and similarly, we can, uh, of course, that this MST is different, uh, is the uh, same as uh, infinity, then there's no relation. So this is a Cox group. All of this uh, information actually encoded in uh, one graph, which is a labeled graph, we call the Cox graph. All the vertices are elements of S. And then we put the edge between them, whenever uh, M S T is different from two, okay, and then we put the label of the edge should be the M S T, which is uh, we can we should be the three or the infinity also, okay. So now I'm trying to give a uh, one example. So these are the example. So. Cox system is uh, this contain the symmetry matrix. So of course one 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 is uh, diagonal, and then off diagonal I put the two, three, and infinity. And then from this Cox, uh, maybe I can also use. Uh, so from the, this Cox uh, system, we can have uh, this Cox group. So we have a three generator, right? So it's a S1 and S2 and S3. And then these are the relation, uh, S1 square, S2 square, S3 square is coming from the, this diagonal and three. And then for example, here we have two, right? So it gives us this relation. So S1, S2 to the, uh, then this become identity, and then here the three, so it give us this relation here. And then of course it's an infinity, so there is no relation anymore. And one of the remark is that this condition, so S1 and S2 and its power, is, is exactly equivalent to the fact that S1, S2, it's commute, so S2 and S1. Because uh, S1 square and S2 square and S3 square is uh, the identity. So again, so this uh, S1 and S2, so here the we I draw the S1, so this is uh, S1, S2, and S3. And S1 and S2 is because two, so there is no edge. And then two and three has uh, this label three. You can put uh, this three. And then also here I put, oh, here. Okay, so this is uh, infinity here. Okay. And then Cox group is uh, irreducible if the, this Cox graph is connected. So for example, this is a uh, connected uh, Cox graph. And so this is uh, irreducible. So actually this uh, example actually coming from the, this hyperbolic uh, reflection group. So you, I just draw the climb model of the hyperbolic space, so H2. And then I draw this triangle. So here I, the dihedral angle should be pi over two, here is a pi over three, and then this is a zero, right? So here, for example, the, in this situation is, uh, if you reflect, so whenever we have a two reflect, 
to reflection and compose them, it's become rotation. So then exactly we can get the, this uh, reflection group is has a, this group presentation is this coxed group. Okay. And if the, this W is irreducible Cox group, then W either spherical, or fine, or large. So here the spherical mean that this W is finite. So this spherical, this mean is finite. And this affine is mean that virtually uh, abelian. And large, it's mean that it, it contain a finite index subgroup, which subject to the free group of rank bigger than one. Okay. So obviously we are interested in this large coxter group. So another thing is that this spherical and affine coxter group actually classify is completely there are list of this coxter group and it's classified classify the Coxter. That's why I think we call all these group is Coxter group. Okay. So before going to the four dimensional this object, we try to understand the dimension three. Okay. Of course, we have uh, this uh, Thurston Den surgery theorem for the many folds. But as I told you before, in general, it's hard to deal with the manifold. So we will use some OV4. It's basically the, it's the same as this uh, polytop whose diahedral angle is sub multiple of pi. So this angle theorem is, uh, is a version, it's an OV4 version of the, this uh, Thurston Den surgery theorem. So let's start with the uh, uh, so here, whenever I put the G, it's a combinatorial N polito. Ah, uh, okay. And, okay, so here the HG, okay, here HG mean that actually the is, okay, it's more in this setting is a co-dimension, uh, co-dimension two phase. Okay, so co-dimension two phase is a rigid actually. And then we put the, this angle, so theta E. Is a pi over m, so it's double multiple over pi. And then these two information we will call labeled n polito. So of course you are familiar with OV4. These are actually the same information as this reflection OV4. It's a the topologically is a polito, and then the singular locus is a boundary of the, this polito. So Andrew theorem is for actually the dimension three. Ah, and then the space of the hyperbolic uh, n polytope, which realize in G, and we caution by this isometry group. So these are the, uh, in terms of the OV4 is a hyperbolic structure on an OV4. And then the, here the terminology is a coxter is meaning that all the diagonal angle should be the sub multiple of pi. So these are the space. And then Andrew theorem is the following. So we have this two combinatorial data, which is all before. So if you look at the difference between the left and right hand side, so here we have uh, this the vertices whose balance is four. Okay. Of course, whenever we have this this kind of vertices, if you perturb a little bit, then there are two cases. Okay, you can split in this form, or you can split in this way. Okay. So this is one direction. So if you look, see the N, so here I put the diagonal angle. So it's pi over three, 
and pi over 3 and pi over 4, these edges. And then if I didn't put the angle here, it means that everything is pi over 2 is right angle. Okay, so for example, this one is right angle and these are the right angle. I didn't put the label, it means the right angle. And of course, whenever we have uh, this uh, labeled polytope or uh, polyhedron, then this gives you the Cox group or the, this Cox system. The reason is that whenever we have uh, this, for example, the one and two, so here the one, here I mean two, so it's one and two. Okay. And then here the Diagonal angle is pi over m, right? So here the m we can put here as a label m. So I just translate the, this label the polytope into the this Cox's group. So this is a label the polytope G M. So this uh, the uh, Cox's group is W M. Okay, and then so here. Okay, so whenever, for example, the, this, the phase four and phase five, these two phases are not adjacent, so we, we should put here the infinity. And similarly, at, in the left hand, this polyhedron is one and two is adjacent, and angle is pi over m, but in this case, the one and two are not adjacent. Adjacent, so it's infinity. Ah, here of course the adjacent means uh, the intersection should be the co-dimension two phase. So in this case, is uh, of course the intersection is vertices, but it's, it's not considered as adjacent. So what is Andrew theorem? So Andrew theorem is that if you just look at this combinatorial object. And then you immediately know which object can be realized as a hyperbolic polyhedron. So here, this is the Andrew theorem is for the general statement, but uh, I'm just trying to give a, one particular example and then trying to explain the what is the theorem. So for example, if this number m is seven, eight, and etc then actually hyperbolic, the space of a hyperbolic structure exists and otherwise is empty. Mm -hmm. So actually we can easily see this fact because for example here is a triangular prism oh, okay. oh. and then we consider uh, the plane which transversal to the, this uh, uh, triangular prism. And then what we get is actually the triangle. Okay. Okay. So actually we get triangle here. Okay. And then if you look at the, this diagonal angle, so here diagonal angle is pi over m, this is pi over three, and is pi over two, right? As I, as I said, this is, I didn't put the label, this is pi over two. And then this angle sum, I mean, if you assume that this, pre, uh, this triangular prism can be realized as a hyperbolic polyhedron, it should be, this angle sum should be less than pi. So exactly that means m should be bigger than six. So from the seven to et cetera. But in the important point of the Andrew theorem is that that's enough to guarantee that actually this combinatorial polyhedron admit the hyperbolic structure. Okay. So one direction is easier, but the other direction is more complicated, uh, the difficult part is so only this condition actually guaranteed that because, okay, we should have uh, this hyperbolic triangle. So it should be, M should be bigger than six, but that's enough to guarantee that actually this polyhedron, the three dimensional this polyhedron is uh, realized as a hyperbolic polyhedron. Okay. 
Okay. So here, uh, okay. So here, actually, you can see that this uh, uh, surgery. So what I mean is that m start from the let's say seven, and then we m is going to infinity. M is more and bigger and bigger, and then this angle is getting smaller and smaller, right? So you know the sense that this polito, this polyhedron, is converts to the right hand side polito, this one. Okay. So and then this uh, right hand side actually, so this here that I drew the this vertices here, actually this uh, this. Uh, it's, uh, okay, this blue blue vertices. Okay, so this vertices is the uh, ideal vertices on the boundary of hyperbolic three space. Okay, so this object is a uh, finite volume. Uh, it's a lift. It's a hyper uh, polyhedron. This is a finite volume, and then. If we do the surgery, so actually left hand side is a surgery object. So left hand side, it, it has uh, become compact. So in other ways, somehow we, if you look at the, this uh, link of the, this idea of this, it should be the Euclidean reflection tool of default. So it's a uh, exactly the rectangle right here. So link of the vertices should be the rectangle. Okay, and then here it's topologically the same, but then we somehow the glue the this part, or we can think about the in this. Upper edge and the lower edge with some of the collapse, so, and then we just we have this. So in this procedure, is basically the OV full version of a uh, tensorial theorem. Okay. So what what uh, this tell us uh, this uh, the re it's a representation. Uh, representation. So these are the Cox group W infinity, and we have uh, this Cox group to the this isometric group of the hyperbolic uh, space. So because whenever whenever we have uh, this Cox polyhedron, and then we consider reflection group generated by the reflection along the all the faces. And then it give us this representation. So and and then previously so M is uh, different from the infinity and then we have uh, this Wm, which is a quotient of a quotient of the W infinity quotient by this uh, normal subgroup generated by these elements, because previously this one and two between this one and two there was there was no relations, but now there are m is finite, then it has the relation, right? So it gives us this. Uh, this map is uh, this homomorphism, low M. So first of all, this fundamental, so this PM, the hyperbolic polyhedron intersect with uh, this hyperbolic space, is fundamental domain for the, this group gamma zero, uh, gamma M, which is the image of the, this one. So as I said, this is a reflection group generated by this all the reflection with respect to this uh, face. And previously I explained the 
m is the finite, of course, bigger than 6, then we have uh, this compact case. So this Pm is entirely inside hyperbolic 3 space, and gamma m should be the uniform lattice. Okay? But if m is infinity, then uh, again, as I said, so intersection with this boundary is uh, this one point and gamma infinite is a non-uniform lattice. So this has an obvious corollary, is that in, we take any neighborhood of the, this omega infinity, which is coming from this finite volume uh, hyperbolic Cox uh, polyhedron, and then there exists rho inside this neighborhood such that rho is not conjugate to the original one. Because previously I explained that this polyhedron is, uh, is Pm, and then M is bigger and bigger, it's converged to the P infinity. So representation also converts to the, this uh, P infinity. So in other words, in any neighborhood, there exists, which is diff essentially different from the, this original low infinity. But this kind of situation is happening only three dimension. The reason is that the following uh, theorem by Galanda and Lagunathan. So dimension bigger than or equal to four, and gamma is uh, like this, then there exists a neighborhood of the, this canonical inclusion. It's mean that because the gamma is a, it's a subgroup of this isometric group of hyperbolic space. So gamma, uh, this rho infinity is a, is a, we consider natural inclusion, a uh, canonical inclusion. Then the, there is neighborhood of this inclusion such that every rho is basically the conjugate to the original one. So in other way, say that if you deform the representation, then essentially the nothing change is a conjugate to the original. One. So these are the big difference between the dimension three and higher than three. Okay. So that that also again the tell us that there is no hyperbolic then surgery for the higher dimensional case. So our strategy will be the somehow obvious. So let's change the target Lie group of the representation from uh, hyperbolic isometry to the, this uh, SL plus minus. So it's basically we're trying to enlarge the hyperbolic geometry to uh, real project geometry. So to do that, actually, uh, we should understand the tits Wimberg uh, theory. So first, we let's try to define a project pre coxa polytope. So this polytope is meaning that the pair P, which is a polyhedron in a project sphere, is uh, described by uh, is half space, so intersection of the half space. So P is an intersection of all the half space in a projective sphere. Uh, here, so it, here the alpha S is a linear functional, is a linear, uh, linear functional In uh, this here, the dimension should be R m plus one, right? So whenever we have a linear functional, it's defined uh, co-dimension one subspace, and we take the half one one part. So this is less than equal to zero. And then for every facet, so every the facet means the co-dimension one face. Then we put the reflection. 
So it's a projective coxa polytop. Uh, is mean the polytop together with the reflections. We put reflection on every face. It means that, of course, reflection is you can describe as this form. So sigma s is identity minus uh, alpha s cross b s. Ah, so here again, alpha s is a linear function. So r n plus one star. And then bs is inside rn plus 1. It's a vector. So alpha s and bs is equal to 2. It's meaning that any vector, any vector inside the corner of this linear function, a function on alpha s, then basically fixed point. Right? So this reflection is fixed. S is point wise. And for example, we put the V S, then sigma S V S should be B S minus two times B S because the alpha S B S two equal to two. We normalize in this way. So this is become minus B S. So B S is corresponding reflection vector and the corner of alpha S is a hyperplane is fixed by uh, my point was fixed. And there was a projective coxa polytop is uh, somehow we trying to imitate a, a tiling, right? So the free coxa polytop is a coxa polytop if intersection of P and gamma P is empty whenever gamma is different from identity. And then, of course, here the gamma is the group generated by this uh, reflection uh, previously assigned when we define this pre coxa polytop. So this is a coxa polytop. So it's basically we have we we, we take the, this orbit is become some tiling of some part of the, this uh, projective sphere. It's a very uh, interesting this the theorem by the Wimberg is that actually the very easy to check when this pre coxa polytope is coxa polytope. So how we can check? So previously reflection is described by the this linear functional alpha s and vector v s, right? So we have uh, this s reflection. Right. And from there, we can easily construct this matrix, which is the S times S matrix. We call the Kata matrix. So A is a, is a alpha, as whose entry should be alpha S and B T. And then this Kata matrix, they find this condition. And actually that is enough to check whether this pre coxa polytope become coxa polytope. So of course, previously we normalized such a way that alpha s b s equal to 2. So a s s should be 2. And for s is different from t, then all the off diagonal entry should be less than equal to 0. And one entry equal to zero, then the other entry should be also zero. It's the opposite one. And the, the con second condition is that we compose a so multiply S T and A T S, and this should be bigger than or equal to four, or four times cosine square pi over M S T for some. MST inside here as a uh, natural number, of oh, course, different from one. So what is the mean? Actually, the particularly the second condition is uh, is very, somehow important. So we have we have a composition of the two reflections, so sigma s and sigma t, because composition of two reflections becomes the rotation, right? Rotation. 
But for example, in this situation, so this AST equal to ATS is four times cosine square pi over MST, exactly same as uh, this composition of the two reflection is rotation by two pi over MST. And for example, the, this AST times ATS, this quantity equal to four. So this is equal to four. So this one equal to four. Then this composition become parabolic. And is bigger than four. Then this composition of these two reflection become hyperbolic elements. And then key point is that this condition is basically guarantee that your pre coxta polytope is a coxta polytope. So actually, I will explain the, the four-dimensional uh, polyhedron and the coxta group, but to check everything is fine, we just check this uh, Carter matrix, then that's enough. Okay. So, so we start with uh, this Cox uh, polytope. So it's a polytope and together with the reflections. And because of Cox uh, polytope, so in every these two reflection or the AST and ATS has a bigger than equal to four or equal to this four times cosine square pi over MST. So obviously this information give you the Cox system and then this Cox system give you Cox group, right? So of course all the Cox system should be all the, this diagonal entry should be one and then off diagonal one, should we put this MST here. And then of course, this, uh, this quantity is bigger than equal to four. Then here the Cox system is entry should be infinity, right? Something like this. So this W is a Cox group associated to this Cox polytope. And gamma is a group generated by the reflection. So the Cox group, uh, the Cox polytope has a, this uh, assigned by this reflection, and then we consider its gamma, which is generated by this reflection. Then, what is the theorem of the Kitts and Bimber? The representation rule, which is given by, so S is mapping to the sigma S. This representation is discrete and faithful. Okay. And moreover, we take the gamma orbital P. This is convex in a projective sphere. And this gamma obviously act on this orbit of a P, but gamma is act properly discontinuously on the interior of this gamma orbit. And that's why this intersection of P and this omega is a fundamental domain of gamma. And if this uh, W is irreducible and large, and the gamma is a subgroup of SL plus minus, it should be acting on this R to the N plus one. And if this is also irreducible, then omega is indeed is properly convex. So is teach Bimberg theory is tell us that it basically, whenever we have this Cox polytope, actually we, somehow get properly convex projective structure on this OV fold. So this is somehow the uh, general way or construct the properly convex uh, structure for this particular OV fold. So, so these are the Euclidean triangle, 
You're right. So here is a pi over three, right? So that's why I think, uh, if you, uh, ref so this is reflection, uh, we consider reflections R1, R2, and R3. Uh, all these are the pi over three, right? So if you reflect them, for example, reflection by R1, and then we have the here a reflection, and then reflection R2, and then here and here. And then you, you keep going, then we will actually tile all the this Euclidean plane. But interesting is that, so as I said, Euclidean geometry is a sub-geometry of this uh, real field geometry. Okay, but inside real projective geometry, actually this oviful, I mean this Euclidean oviful, actually deform to the properly convex one. So I will show you how deform. So see, so it's still this is a has a properly convex. This is a properly convex domain. So this, this open triangle is actually the properly convex domain. And this previous Coxa group, which is, uh, has a, this group presentation from the, this Euclidean reflection, has a, this also admit uh, this properly convex uh, domain. So the so main difference between the somehow the hyperbolic case and the, this properly convex, uh, this real projective uh, geometry is somehow hyperbolic, uh, Space, high public geometry, actually it cannot have uh, this abelian this subgroup of, of rank bigger than one is inside some high public space. But the real projective the geometry somehow can contain those this abelian subgroup. That's why we can actually do the surgery in the end. So now I'm trying to uh, exp uh, explain the how we actually, what kind of object actually have uh, this uh, surgery in dimension four. So this is, a, I drew via the Schlegel diagram. It's, well, previously I drew this triangular prism, which is three dimensional object. I project to the two dimensional plane. So similarly, I'm trying to draw the four dimensional polyto. And this polytope I'm trying to project to the three dimensional space. So now you are, uh, what you are seeing is that is a four dimensional polyhedron, a polytope. Okay. And then I'm trying to explain the, some other analogy to the previous example. So these are the object actually doing via surgery. So where is the left one? So left one is here. So now I'm trying to draw this uh, uh, polytope, which is a triangle times triangle. So, so actually dimension higher than three is interesting is happening. For example, dimension three, every co-dimension one phase is basically phase, is everything is adjacent, then only possible polytope should be the simplex, right? But for example, in this case, this polytope is a combinatorially triangle times triangle. So what is the co-dimension one phase? What is the facet? The facet is, for example, you can get is uh, like this HG times triangle. So here, every co-dimension phase is triangular prism. So you see here, for example, so this one, This one is a triangular prism, right? All this uh, facet is triangular prism here. So these are the objects. And then right hand side, so what is this? So, ah, so here is so whenever I said delta D is a D dimensional simplex. So this one is uh, interval, right? This is a segment. And then times this triangle. So, this one, the so delta one cross delta two is a triangular prism, and then take the cone of them to so the pyramid. So base, base polyhedron should be the triangular prism, and then we take the cone over this one. So you see, uh, so these are the vertices, is apex, 
And then link of this R apex is exactly the triangular prism. Okay. So this just now explained that this uh, how you can actually see this four dimensional polytope. And then I'm trying to uh, give the, this uh, this dihedral angle on which I'm the co-dimension two phase. Okay, because that's the information of the label polytope. So I previously I explained the what is the combinatorial data is polytope. And then, and then I'm trying to give a uh, uh, how to put uh, this labeling on the, this Ricci. So oh, okay, I already the, uh, click them. So this is a uh, uh, for example that this this number one, two, three, four, five, six is corresponding to the codimension one phase, which is a facet. And then for example, I'm just uh, this red one, red facet is corresponding to this one. And then for example, the two is the, the this one. This is another facet. And then I'm trying to give a, so you see between these two facet, there are here intersection. So what I'm saying is that these two facet are adjacent. And then I give the dihedral angle here is a pi over m. Okay? And then somehow I'm trying to say that m is bigger and bigger. In the end, m becomes infinity. Then, you see, let's imagine that this intersection is, I mean, this triangle the triangle becomes smaller and smaller, and then you will end up with uh, this kind of the situation. So it has an infinity. So, and then actually we want to say that the right-hand side, this four-dimensional polytop actually can be, uh, I mean, the, with uh, this, of course, this uh, labeling. So actually the one, so one is a red, this facet, and two is a, this blue facet. And then the third one, this one, is actually the outside of this, uh, this one here, outside of this. So, and then four, five, six is uh, or the facet is around this, uh, the, the other, these three uh, facet. Okay. So these are the data of the, this, uh, Combinatorial uh, polytope and the labeled polytope, and then actually the right hand side object actually can be realized as a hyperbolic polytope, and then this again this I mean this blue the blue vertices is lie on the this boundary of a hyperbolic space, and the left hand side is object is actually the surgery. Obifold. Surgery polytope. Okay. So let's see. So this is a definition. So note, for the notation, so C G is a space of the old projective Cox polytope, which realizing this labeled polytope G, and then of course equation by this uh, uh, S L plus minus. And then if you familiar, then just properly convex projective structure on OV4 G. Okay, so what we approve is that for M is infinity, then this space of convex projective structure is exactly the same as the space of hyperbolic structure. And this Tumakin actually already knew that, and then those objects actually have uh, admit the hyperbolic structure. So these are the, the finite volume object in the end. And M is again 
between the six and infinity, then here is there exists a properly convex project structure on a disk ball, which is actually two different one, PM and PM star. And M is different from this two quantity, then actually uh, empty. So C, G, M, so M is less than uh, seven, so it's from the six is empty. So previously, okay, let's back to the this picture again. You see, here again, somehow is a two, three, M. So M is uh, uh, actually, this part should be somehow the hyperbolic, then again, we have uh, this kind of the uh, uh, existence. And similarly, we can have uh, this Cox group to, so via this uh, teach Wimberg theory, we can construct this Cox uh, group representation. So from this W infinity to uh, SL plus minus, and again, this M is finite, then we have this group, W infinity quotient by normal subgroup generated by this uh, composition times M. So somehow it's very similar to the previous uh, uh, description of this Andrew theorem, but it's, uh, we use the teach Wimberg theory to get this convex projective structure. So again, if M equal infinity, then this omega infinity, which is the interior of this gamma infinite orbit of P infinity is ellipsoid. And this quotient is finite. And M is between this number, then PM is completely inside omega m, and then quotient is compact. So, so if you look at the, this, this is a Cox group generated by four, five, six. So what is this? This one is exactly the, previous I explained this uh, Euclidean reflection from this triangle whose all the diagonal angle is pi over three, right? So these are the, this Cox group contain, I mean the contain finite index subgroup, which is abelian of rank bigger than one, right? Actually, virtually C2, so this one, four, five, six. So that's somehow tell us that by theorem of the Benoit, this, this omega m is not strictly convex. And uh, this boundary is not C1. Because omega is strictly convex if and only if uh, this group should be grown hyperbolic. But this Cox group, uh, it's not chromo hyperbolic because it contains this uh, abelian part. Okay. So this corollary is is quite interesting because, uh, as I said, in general, it's also is quite difficult to construct this those somehow exotic divisible convex set. But here we construct uh, some other new example, meaning that there exists four-dimensional divisible convex domain, which contain properly embedded triangles. So here, the, this abelian part is somehow contribute as a two-dimensional object. So originally, this this domain is a four-dimensional, but it contains a triangle, not the tetrahedron. So somehow, in this way, is different from the previously known example, which is constructed by Benoit. So here, these are the tetrahedron, the so three-dimensional, these are the three-dimensional object, right? 
three dimension object. Three dimension object. And it has uh, this, is, uh, you imagine that it's hyperbolic space, H3. And these are the ideal vertices, because you see here, three, 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 three triangle group right here. So these are cos, these vertices. And then you can put it here. But the, you can actually deform this uh, tetrahedron. So somehow in hyperbolic setting, you cannot actually get this ideal vertex is, is put it out without changing this dihedral angle, right? But you can do in a projective setting, so you can put it out somehow, then you can actually cut the this vertices. Then you will end up with a triangular prism. And then you can consider actually deflection with respect to this face. Okay? So you will get the, this kind of the compact object. So as I said uh, again, I didn't put the label. It means that the right angles, so all these are the right angle, except uh, these two. Huh? And again, you see here, we see the triangle whose dihedral angle is pi over three and pi over three and pi over three. This is the Abelian subgroup of rank two. So these are the three-dimensional three convex, uh, divisible convex domain. This is a three-dimensional, oh. three-dimensional. And it's contained Abelian subgroup of rank two, rank two. So difference is a co-dimension one, okay? But here the we construct is a four-dimension object is a, but inside rank two abelian subgroup. So it's, so main is uh, these are some of the different uh, properly convex domain which is not uh, strictly convex. Uh, thank you. So yeah, is there any question? I, probably I cannot hear the question, right? But ah, okay, okay, I see, I see. Okay. Can you hear this? That would be no. no. Okay. Okay. Uh, but is, is that it, it was okay or? <laughs> I think it's. Can you hear? If can you speak loudly? 